Okay, uh, welcome back uh, to, the to the second session of the conference. This is a session on monetary policy, credit and banking. I'm very happy to have here a very uh, great lineup of papers and discussions that we will uh, be now uh, that will be now presented in the in the conference. The first paper will be by Oscar Jordá from uh, University of California Davis and the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. The discussant uh, will be Margarita Bottera from Bank of Italy. Then uh, we will uh, uh, hear a second paper by Shebnem Kalemi Otskan by Brown University and uh, uh, <clears throat> Katarina Bergant from the IMF will be the discussant. Both paper are, uh, in my opinion, a great papers that speaks to the uh, transmission of monetary policy, to structural features, actually, of transmission. One questioning the long-run uh, neutrality of monetary policy, the other one instead uh, going more granular in the bank firm data and looking at the uh, interaction between uh, uh, market structure, financial constraint, and the strength of uh, monetary policy transmission. Without further ado, I'll give the floor to Oscar. It's a privilege to be here today, for which I'm very thankful. Uh, this is joint work uh, with my colleagues Sanjay Singh and Alan Taylor. All of us have joint appointments with a university and a central bank. In the case of myself and Sanjay, we both work for the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. Alan Taylor just joined the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee. And therefore, I will be very punctilious in noting that these are our views and not the views of either Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, the Federal Reserve Board, or the Bank of England, especially given the contents of the paper. So let me tell you what the paper is about. A few years back, we started doing research and noting something curious, which was that when you looked at the responses of output or economic activity more generally to interest rates, it felt that it took a long time for output to come back to the initial state. And in fact, the more we started looking at this, the more we realized that the literature had also found this result. It's just that it felt that it wasn't a result. So there's a paper already in 98 by Bernanke and Mihoff and not in the published version, but in the working paper version in the appendix, they have this result where they do their analysis and they show an input response of output that doesn't really come back after, I forget the number of years, but a long time. And they sort of brushed it aside as well, you know, there could be errors here, maybe, maybe the error bands are wide enough, uh, but they were puzzled by it clearly. And they so said during the writing of the paper, and somehow during the published version that disappeared. So then we decided to go forward with the paper and, and investigate this question because you think about it, a great deal of identific identification assumptions in macro basically start with the premise that monetary policy does not have long run effects. So you think of something like identification a la Blanchard and Croix, then if you impose that constraint, but that constraint isn't the right constraint in the data, then it's not clear what you're doing with, with the analysis. And so once we started digging into this question, what we found was that indeed this, this result is robust. We obviously thought at first that the way to go about investigating the long run effects of monetary policy requires a couple of things. One is to have a long time series to see whether this effect is really something new or something that has always been there. And second, to look at a panel of countries to see whether this was specific to the US or was it more generalized. And so naturally, having done work with historical data, we pivoted, pivoted toward using long time series and, and a panel of data. And the results that, it will, you, that I will show you in a minute basically indicate that indeed, there are long run effects of monetary policy on the economy. And when you think about it for a little bit, perhaps isn't as surprising as we've come to believe. So, you know, there's a quote in the paper from Ricardo back in 1790X, something like that. 
So it's been over 200 years of orthodoxy that we've been trained to think about monetary policy as not being really a tool for growth, which indeed we also find. <coughs> but we also find that it is a tool that can have long-run consequences. In other words, you can be in a state in which you can have stable inflation and low unemployment and yet not have achieved as much potential output as you could have otherwise. And that's because, if you think for a second, when you raise interest rates and investment declines, well, one of the categories of investment is, for example, research and development. And you think to yourself, well, research and development is probably one of the things that helps improve total factor productivity. And total factor productivity is the engine of growth. So that channel alone should already alert you to the fact that perhaps monetary policy is not as neutral as we've been taught to believe. Does that mean that we should therefore revise the way we write our policy rules? Well, that's also not as clear as you'd think. Because the fact that monetary policy has long-run effects does not necessarily mean that we have to revise our monetary policy rules. Having high inflation is itself something that has tremendous welfare implications. And so if any of you have been following the uh, electoral campaign in the US, you've probably noticed the discomfort and the discontent that the electoral uh, public has with high inflation. And so it's clear that the central bank has a very definite mandate to maintain inflation at target. And the fact that our results exist does not negate that. So I want to be very clear about that because there's the risk of overinterpreting what we find. All right, so on with the show. So here's uh, another piece of evidence that we're not the first to think about the role of demand shocks and whether they have actually long run effects on the economy. And so here's a quote from now Secretary of Treasury uh, Janet Yellen, previously chair of the Board of Governors. But in that speech that she gave, that's quoted in the slide, she clearly thinks that demand shocks can have effects on the economy that last for more than we've been accustomed to think. And so we said, well, let's go ahead and, and ask that question more formally. And as I anticipated, we require three things. One is get data. Well, that part was easy because we've been doing research on historical data for a long time. And we've been publishing this data publicly and making it available. So that part was the easy part. The second part was, well, you need some method of identification of a monetary policy shock. And that part, I think, we also sorted out to at least what I think is a satisfactory way. And I'll discuss it in more detail in a minute. But in a sense, we borrowed it uh, from a previous paper. And the third paper is, well, what approach should we use? Now, I'm contractually obligated to use local projections. But there's actually good reasons to use local projections in this particular setting. There's a new paper by um, Pepe Montiel Olea and Blackboard Muller and two co-authors whose name I should remember because I'm sure they will become very prominent very shortly. In that paper, they basically argue that um, local projections uh, relative to VARs are robust to misspecification. And not only that, but they actually provide the correct confidence coverage for input responses, even though they have bigger standard errors. And the reason is that VARs basically tend to suffer from the problem that we tend to put too few lags. And so even though they're more precise, in a sense they're more biased, and when you put those two things together, even in situations where you might think that the amount of misspecification is small, they actually end up suffering more from bias than local projections do. And therefore, in a setting where you're very interested in getting the long run correctly, using a VAR is more problematic than using local projections. So what did we find after we put these ingredients together and we thought about this problem? Well, we looked at data and we run the experiment over 12 years. And over the 12 years that we run the experiment, real GDP remains lower than um, relative to its pre-shock trend. And that seems like an awful long time 
for GDP to be below trend. And you'd think, well, you know, in Europe especially, we are very well aware of labor hysteresis stories. They've been with us, at least, at least when I was growing up, that, that was the, a, a, a big explanation for Spanish unemployment and, and things of that nature. And so what's surprising or was surprising to us is that this was not a story of labor hysteresis. It's a story about capital accumulation and TFP growth. And so that to, to us was eye-opening. Of course, retrospectively, once we thought about it, it, it became much more natural. The other question that we investigated is, of course, is it raising interest rates that generates this issue, or is it lowering interest rates, or are they symmetric or not? And here I go back to the introduction where I said, you can't really stimulate the economy into high, achieving a higher plane of potential growth, but you can definitely uh, prevent the economy from reaching that plane. And so we'll talk a little bit about sign asymmetry. And finally, I will conclude by saying we are not the only ones that have found this recently. And we're not the only ones that have found this for the US. And there's examples for the UK. I will only show you one set of examples. But basically what we did is take papers from the literature published, one in the AR, the other one I forget what journal is specifically, and then ran their model for more periods than they reported in the paper. And lo and behold, the results are similar to ours. That is that a monetary policy shock seems to have a very long life in economic activity. So since Claudiane is here, let me start by saying that her colleagues at the Banque de France were absolute gentlemen in sharing their data with us. And not only that, I mean, you expect that when someone puts out a database in the public that they'll, they'll be gracious enough to share it with you, but we actually emailed them and asked for some of the raw data and they're immediately facilitated every sort of uh, access to their raw data because we wanted to do different corrections than they had done. And so I'd like to acknowledge that that is a practice that we should all follow. And so bravo to the Bank of France for, for doing that. And we also merged that database that the Bank of France put together with our own macrohistorical databases. And both databases, by the way, are available on the links that you see on the slide there. So that's sorted out. We have data now on a bunch of macro variables. We have a, a nice data set on productivity and ways that allow us to break down GDP into its components, so that's great. Let's talk about identification. So how are we going to go about identification? Identification we're going to approach using the trilemma of international finance. Basically what it means is that assets with the same risk characteristics traded in two different countries should have the same returns adjusted for exchange rate risk. So if you're pegging your currency in principle, that means that you've eliminated the exchange rate risk. So those two assets should trade for the same rate of return. So we're going to exploit that idea and say, you know, if you're a country that's pegging to the US, then in a sense, you're facing a situation where you cannot simultaneously control monetary policy and exchange rate and so on and so forth. And, cap and capital flows, okay? You cannot have, you can control two out of the three, but you cannot control all three at the same time. And so that means to us that pegging countries are likely to inherit a lot of the fluctuations in interest rates that are generated from the base country they're pegging to, rather than to fluctuations that are primarily driven by domestic monetary policy. And so that's going to be our, our starting point. But we're going to go a step further. We're going to say, well, Let's focus not just on movements of the base country interest rate, but let's focus on fluctuations of the base country interest rates that we can't explain. And so we're going to focus on those residuals as base country fluctuations and use that as an instrument. And secondly, we're going to adjust for whether or not capital can flow freely between the two economies. Okay, so 
the less capital mobility there is, obviously that is going to attenuate the transmission of base country fluctuations onto pegging country fluctuations. And so that's basically the idea behind the construction of our instrumental variable. And so that's, that's what's in the slide with a bunch of math, but you got my word, so that's probably clear. Now, <clears throat> when you're looking at historical data, you have to make some compromises, and the compromises that we make here is how are we going to think about who is a base country and who is a pegging economy and so on and so forth. And that table that you have there basically tells the story. There's going to be different eras in our data set. Sometimes the UK is going to be what we consider the, the base country for many others. Basically, it's the gold standard era. Then we're going to think about some sort of triumvirate between the UK, the US, and France. Obviously, there's going to be then uh, sort of a Bretton Woods era where the US is the dominant currency. And nowadays, we think of quote unquote Germany, but what would really mean is the Euro area as being the dominant base country uh, for our analysis. And you can see more or less the decomposition of the eras and the countries that peg to those. So the first question is, well, how about this instrument? How good is it? And so this is a, a table that basically tells you what the pass-through is of those base country monetary shocks onto the pegging economy uh, shocks. Interest rates, sorry. So if you look at the table itself, it says that for every 1% uh, change in the base country unexplained interest rate, uh, you get about 59 basis points of pass-through. And that actually happens to be very similar to what other people have found in the literature where they were just looking at the trilemma itself. If you look at countries that don't peg, the pass-through is much smaller. It's about half, 27 basis points. But still, it's actually pretty significant. Okay? So we're going to use both, realizing that each of them has a different pass-through. We're also going to control for a bunch of other macro variables. You have a list there, the usual suspects. Basically, what we want to do is say, OK, in addition to all that we can uh, explain using these macro controls, we want to then make sure that we're using exogenous variation in whatever country we're looking at. So we have this combination of control and instrumental variables. And so you have there, our specification is going to include two lags, and the transformations are the ones you would expect. Our sample is going to start in 1900 because the Bank de France data starts a little later than our data set, but otherwise you can see uh, the sample there. So then we're going to approach this problem by using panel local projections, using instrumental variables. And so we're going to use the cumulative change in output, and we're going to look at the change in the interest rate instrumented by our instrumental variable, and on the right-hand side, having all those controls that I described in the previous slide. And the focus is going to be on the coefficient beta. Beta is going to measure the impulse response to an interest rate shock, okay? And that's the headline result. So this was the first thing that we had seen in a number of our previous experiments was to say, you know, um, 12 years after, sh after the shock, GDP is still about 4% lower than it was at the start of the experiment. And so we thought at first that there must be something wrong. So then we said, okay, let's break this down a little bit. Uh, let's first look at what happens to interest rates. Maybe is that the shock to interest rates is very persistent. And so that's why it's generating this declining output. But in fact, the short-term nominal rate seems to go back to its original level fairly quickly, at least relative to the 12 years that we're plotting. And we also wanted to have a sense check. Basically, you expect that if you raise interest rates, inflation is going to go down, and so that also turned out to be the case. So that was good news. And of course, you, know, you do a bunch of robustness checks, and there you have a list that is quite extensive. And every time we had a referee report, we added one more to the list, or two more to the list, or three more to the list. And that list kept getting longer and longer and longer. And that's because the referees came back to us like, 
I see nothing wrong with your paper, but I just don't believe the results. And so we just had to keep going and keep going. Well, okay, where, where does that result come from? What's the mechanism? So here you have the composition of that original impulse response on the, on the what is it, the left-hand side. And now we're going to look at its components. We're going to look at what happens to labor, capital, and TFP. And this was also surprising to us. It's like, oh, wow, not much going on on labor. Everything seems to be about capital and TFP. I said, wow, OK, well, that's very interesting. Let's dig a little bit more into this. What about if you look at constructions, meaning you raise interest rates? Well, you have pretty much a picture that says real GDP declines by a little bit more. Labor does uh, show up as having a little bit more hysteresis, but it seems to go back after a number of years. But capital and TFP here seem to decline by quite a bit. What if we go the other way? Not the other way, nothing. So you lower interest rates, it doesn't have much of an effect on real GDP. Uh, it doesn't have much of an effect on labor not much on capital or not much on TFP. These are flipped because they have, I, I, I'm showing them so you can compare them to the previous. So you have to think of flipping these because if you lower interest rates, you expect GDP to go up. But I flipped them so you can compare them to this picture, okay? Okay. Well, what about other people? Okay, so here's an example. Uh, this is from a recent paper in the AER by Brenner Meyer and Chris Sims and uh, uh, Pali and Sastry. And so the, or the original paper, I think, showed something like 48 months, and it stopped there. And we said, okay, um, well, let's, let's, run the, let's run the movie uh, a few more months. And so there we run up to 96 months, and what do you see? Well, industrial production in response to a monetary shock of 1%, seems to not go back to its initial state in the 96 months that we plotted. If you look at UK data from Miranda Grippino and Rico, can't remember the, the journal, but anyway, it's, it's a completely different setup, different, completely different VAR, completely different identification. They use some sort of uh, Bayesian approach that's different from Brunner Meyer and co-authors, this is US data, theirs is UK data, everything's different, and the picture is the same. Okay, so there's a lot more in the paper. We have a model that shows you why do we think that the trilemma is a proper identification approach? What do you have to assume about you know, uh, tradables versus non-tradables? What do we have to assume about capital markets, et cetera, et cetera? When would you be able to identify monetary policy? In some earlier version of the paper, we also provided a mechanism that was a little bit reduced form. It was a new Keynesian model where we had some extended version of the TFP process following a paper by Stadler. That got washed away with subsequent referee waves. Um, so we did all that, and so where, where do we come down? Because this, in principle, seems to have important policy implications. So first is, okay, yes, monetary policy has long run effects, but those seem to be mostly when you raise interest rates, not when you lower interest rates. So that's the first observation. The second one is that it seems to come from the decumulation of the capital stock and the decline of TFP growth not from the labor market. So those are the two takeaways. And then you say, okay, uh, should I believe these results? Because this seems to go against the grain of what we've been taught in class. Well, you know, we had a small open economy in New Keynesian model to formalize the identification, even though I think intuitively we all get it. We use local projections because we worry about possible issues of VARs having too few lags and therefore not picking up long run dynamics. So we fixed that. And then we threw a spaghetti 
on the on the wall approach to all sorts of robustness by splitting the sample to post World War II, pre World War One, pre World War Two, sorry. Uh, just looking at breaks in the TFP process that some have documented. Everything that you can imagine we threw uh, to the wall and er nothing seemed to break this result. It was, it was surprisingly robust. And now for the policy implication. And this is something that I learned from my co-author, uh, Sanjay. Because I said, Sanjay, does this mean that then we have to change the policy rule and have basically an element that says you need to worry about long-term growth as part of your Taylor rule. And he said, not necessarily. It depends on the model that you write. So that's kind of an open question for all of you. What's the right answer? I don't know. So is the right approach to continue doing what we do? I think Sanjay was saying, if you write a typical New Keynesian model, even with this mechanism that we wrote down, then there's a set of results that will basically say, do what you're doing right now. The idea is you just keep targeting inflation, you keep targeting, let's say, uh, activity gaps, unemployment or potential out or, or output, and then that's it. And then that's, that's welfare maximizing. But that's just one model. You can write a model where that's no longer true. Now, what is the right answer? I don't know. We haven't done it. So I think that's one area of further research that either you or us will at some point tackle. But that's the main lesson. Okay. Now, the other main lesson is, I'm going to kind of give you a preview of other work that I'm doing right now, is you know, if you think that this result is robust and that you think that monetary policy can have effects on TFP and investment and so on, then, especially in this house where there's a, a, a fair amount of concern on climate policy, it seems to say, hey, you know, there's a view of the world that says that when you have high interest rates, that will tend to shift technology from green to brown, because brown is cheaper. And because this seems to have long run effects on investment and capital, those will tend to basically delay investment in green technologies. Now, should that be part of your policy rule? I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it's a reality. This is what will happen. I have some research that I'm doing at the moment that seems to go in that direction. Okay, So there's probably more other directions that one can take, but let me stop there and give more time to my discussions to, to thrash my paper. Thank you. Okay, so thank you for, to the organizer for having me here. I come after all the many referees, so not sure what is left to say, but I'll try to suggest avenue for future research. Uh, the views that I express, of course, are just mine again. So as uh, Oscar was uh, saying, the paper really is about uh, long-run money neutrality. And, uh, Bonnie neutrality is something that we have been taught in classroom and that generation of practitioners have been living with. And in a nutshell, what he says is that you can play with monetary aggregate as much as you want to steer the economy in the short run, but then in the long run, you don't have to pay any price uh, or there is no gain to be made. And this paper basically challenges this notion and it's not the only one. So maybe, uh, especially fitting for an, for an audience like this, it's time to rethink the whole approach to, to the issue. More narrowing to this paper, I see uh, with uh, three independent contribution. And each contribution has its own value and it will have uh, a tremendous impact on research from uh, future work. So first of all, the author presents a new identification strategy, uh, which is solidly founded in a theoretical model to um, establish uh, the causality from monetary policy to real outcome, which is uh, clearly marred with endogeneity. Uh, the second contribution is methodological. So uh, the author extends the local projection methodology so to deliver consistent, uh, uh, very long run impulse response function. And again, very useful for, other type, for answering other type of questions. 
And uh, finally, they put together these two methodological blocks to address the question of the paper. So is money neutral in the long run? Does monetary policy have long run effect or no? And if it has them, are they symmetric or no? Uh, there are two charts that are the takeaway from the 90 plus long paper. And I say this as a compliment because it's difficult to condense uh, such a rich paper in two charts. This is the first one. So what you see here is the response of a 100 basis point contractionary shock on real GDP. It's big and uh, it lasts very long, more than 10 years. And more than that, it doesn't come equally from all the three basic components from GDP, but it comes mostly from capital decumulation and uh, TFP. And uh, more worryingly, this very long effect comes from uh, tightening shocks only. This is a chart taken from an old economic letter. I, I assume it's qualitatively still valid. So. But, but this chart tells you that uh, you, know, you can play. When you do something uh, contractionary, then you will have longer effect on real GDP. When you do the same action with the opposite sign, then basically nothing happens. So this is the paper. Uh, my discussion, I will raise three points and I'll try to frame them as uh, avenues for future research because the paper really doesn't need uh, another referee adding another robustness check. So the first point as Oscar was touching upon himself is that the results are almost uh, shockingly large, shockingly large for uh, the audience that is uh, brought up with money neutrality. And I agree that there is an effort in the last section of the paper to try to see if uh, the result in the same ballpark come from extending other models, but I'll suggest uh, an alternative identification strategy that may be explored in later work. Uh, then there is another pressing question, which is what drives the asymmetric effect of monetary policy, which are there. It's unambiguous that they are there. And on this, the paper is, uh, is still silent. And I'll touch finally on the normative implication for practitioner, given that this uh, conference means to bridge science and practice. So the identification is based in the trilemma idea. And here, said in a very simplistic way, uh, when you peg, when you're a country that pegs its currency to a benchmark country, then you import some degree of monetary policy action, which is exogenous to your own domestic condition because it's, uh, it stems from the benchmark country. And the idea is convincing and the approach is uh, rigorous, but of course, when it comes to uh, exclusion restrictions, so the moment you take the model to the data, then there is no silver bullet, okay? There is always the possibility to find an exotic omitted variable that co-moves uh, the monetary policy action and uh, uh, the real variable. I'll, I'll I think that point number two is particularly interesting and I don't think it's touched uh, on in the paper. So much, uh, for much of the sample, the benchmark country is the US dollar. And we all know that when the Fed sneezes, everybody in the room catches a cold. So the question is, uh, are we not omitting uh, the financial instabilities that may be caused by uh, monetary policy action in the benchmark country? Because then it could be, if you don't control for, for, this, uh, for these dynamics, that uh, uh, when the benchmark moves the monetary policy, it creates financial instability crests that cause uh, uh, GDP stress uh, in, uh, the, um, in the peg country. Um, but these, these two points were just there to set the stage to, uh, to my, my main comment, which is again that the results are very, very large. And, and I really like the local projection methodology as any applied microeconomist. So, uh, when I was thinking about way to robustify this result, I thought that certainly we want to maybe move away from the PEG benchmark country framework, which is the one that leaves open uh, the door for this omitted variable problem. Uh, improves a little bit maybe on the monetary policy shock identification, because in the paper these are uh, proxied by yearly changes in, in interest rate while the literature has been moving towards more high frequencies approach as we have discussed this morning. And, uh, and still uh, it remains fully compatible with the local projection. So one suggestion, but admittedly I haven't worked through all the details, so Oscar just take it as a, you know, input for possible future research is to uh, graft uh, the Gabe and Cogen granular instrumental variable on local projection. And the idea is that maybe there are some country where 
so granular player in the economy that their monetary policy shocks spill over to other countries exogenously. And, uh, and then uh, if you buy this idea, the, the, the practical implementation is not complicated. So you take countries, you create for each country uh, whatever a uh, yearly uh, um, uh, accumulated sum of monetary policy shock, even at high frequency. And then for each country J, you sum up the shock, the monetary policy shock it received from its trading partner, for instance, scaling them by the, um, by the floor trade. And then you clean the instrument with the methodology and you plug it in the local projection framework. So this would be a way to generalize the peg, peg intuition, the international trade line idea, and, and see if the results are again in the same ballpark of the paper, of those in the paper. So on to my second comment. Um, the asymmetric result, the asymmetric effect of monetary policy, you have seen them in the charts. They are very strong. They are there, nothing to say on them, but why are they there? So the local projection framework is an ideal setup to test and horse race against uh, each other, various alternative and various channel. Uh, there are many, uh, I suggest two. Uh, w which are big absentees in the paper, so financial and credit markets. And, uh, and my question is for the author is, do financial and credit markets respond in an asymmetric way to tightening and loosening, and especially respond uh, to tightening shock in a way that subsequent loosening shock cannot undo? And what you see here in this chart is, is purely narrative, so purely for the fun of it. It's the level of credit standard prevailing according to the Euro Area Bank Lending Survey as taking as a base 100 the level at the beginning of the survey 2002. So the Bank Lending Survey as the loan officer survey uh, asks uh, uh, loan officers to report variation over the preceding quarter in their level of credit standards. So technically, very naively, you could accumulate and get the picture that, uh, that I see, that I present here. And what you see here is that uh, credit, level, credit, level, credit standard level went up uh, until 2008 and then practically didn't respond at all to the long period of uh, low and negative interest rate. So this would hint that there is a sluggishness in, in credit market that doesn't uh, revert when there are loosening. And another culprit could be uh, uncertainty. So we know that uncertainty is related to the investment rate in the economy. This goes back to Bloom paper several years ago. So one possibility is that uh, uh, when there are a, a tightening shock or a sequence of tightening shock, then uncertainty goes up and then uh, investment are pulled back, but they don't um, recover when losing shock, shock uh, happen in the future. Okay, so finally, uh, my last point on a normative implication for practitioners. I must say that reading this paper was tough. I mean, if, uh, if we buy face value what Oscar was saying, um, then we are certainly not part of the solution of uh, taking the economy uh, to its uh, full potential. And uh, if you take the euro area, then considering uh, I've taken Jarocinski and Karadi shock, but you can take Carlos and the picture would be roughly the same. There have been about the same number of uh, tightening and easing shock. And uh, if, if we conclude the reasoning with Oscar uh, uh, results, then we might have uh, pulled the uh, economy away from its potential. And this is a thesis that was actually put forward also in a Financial Time article, which I came across later. But is this fair? So as uh, actually we touched upon so, so in the introduction, welfare implications are, are more complex. And when I think about this problem, I like to frame it as a mean variance trade-off. So uh, is it, would it, I would like to hear the author's opinion whether uh, one could think of a framework when you trade off um, short-term uh, benefits of taming inflation against the long-run cost of losing potential. And I, I would definitely be interested in knowing, you know, where the trade-off line uh, lies and, uh, you know, how, how should we as a practitioner behave. And, uh, and I'm done. Thanks. Thank you, Margarita. <laughs> so I would give the floor back to Oscar before collecting questions. But uh, please, if you want to reply first to the... Uh, to thank profusely 
Margarita, for a very useful uh, discussion. I, I think all her suggestions are great. Um, just let me touch on the issue of uh, the exclusion restriction, which we do, and it might have fallen off in one of the different referee iterations, but at some point we had a model, uh, a two country model with um, uh, an open economy model, and uh, we basically calibrated the extent of possible violations of the exclusion restriction, and then we said, okay, let's give so, some sort of range, and after you adjust for the fact that you have this potential violation of the exclusion restriction using a paper by Tim Conley and co-authors, um, the result basically stays the same. It is true that the violation of the exclusion restriction would make the decline in GDP a little less uh, prominent, but basically the shape is the same. And so everything else more or less fell in place. I think the, the last conclusion that you put out is, is the one I wish I knew how to answer, because that's really the, the million dollar question, I think. Um, I, that's why I was very careful since everybody, all of us co-authors have a role in, in a policy institution not to say mm -hmm. <laughs> what we should do. But that is the, the key question to answer based on this evidence. But thank you, that was great. Thanks a lot. Maybe Philip has a question. Sorry. So, so, so this is not really a, a, a technical uh, question, but it's more, and I, I know you must have handled this to some extent, that often, and it goes back to what, what a shock is, because like the Brunemeyer paper, I think their context was before the monetary tightening, 03 to 06, there's a big credit boom. Also in your area, there's a credit boom. So if you look at the, I mean, uh, as discussed, you know, there was a hiking episode right before the global financial crisis and the area. So, so the question is, what is causally the hiking episode and what is causally the whatever misallocation might have been built up in, in the credit boom? Now, the Brunemeyer paper, because I was looking when you were speaking, basically says the longer effect of the credit boom was via monetary tightening, so it, which actually lines up with what uh, you had. But then the other one, more generally, just supply shocks, because quite often uh, central banks have tightened uh, because there's been an adverse supply shock. And of course, that's also true this time. And that adverse supply shock could have long-run consequences. So it's not to, to rule out uh, the monetary non-neutrality, it's just in terms of quantifying the monetary policy contribution versus whatever fundamentals triggered the monetary tightening in the first place. Sorry, collect some. Well. So my name is Leo von Tatten here from the ECB. Um, I think this is a very interesting paper and uh, the implications are indeed, could be <laughs> troublesome. I have a very, very super simple question. Maybe it's, 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 it's stupid, but you know, based on an ob observation, if I followed your slides uh, kind of uh, correctly, you use terms like persistent, more persistent over a long period of time when you describe your results, but you do not use the term permanent. Now, from an empirical perspective, this is probably doesn't make a big difference, but from when it comes really to the, to the core of the theory and the choice of models, uh, it does make a, a very big difference. And in fact, the solo model itself you know, is known to have very long drawn out transitional periods. Um, can take very long until you go back to the steady state, but still we use it as a reference point from the perspective of, of models we use. Thanks, Jos. Hello, Yunus uh, Aksoy, uh, I'm visiting, uh, yeah, working at ECB for uh, short term. Um, just a, essentially just a, a, a clarification question. So your results are uh, representing the full sample that you present, of course, over 100 years. And I just wonder uh, uh, whether you get sort of stable, sub sufficiently long subsample uh, results. You know, looking for 60, 70 years subsample results, whether uh, you find a systematic violation of the uh, neutrality. Okay. okay. 
Yeah, I'll take some. I'll, I'll, I'll answer some of the questions. Um, so, I, yeah, I agree with you, Philip, that um, you know the economy is hit by multiple shocks at the same time, and I mean I think this is goes to the crux of what we do in macro all the time, which is you know you try to come up with some identification scheme so you can just parse that part of the problem that you are thinking of analyzing, but realizing that the economy is subject to too many things. So, you know, um, this is a question of uh, basically challenging the identification assumption and, and seeing whether it, it holds water or not. I think, though, your question ties nicely with Margarita's uh, last comment about the role of credit. And that's one area that, even though we've done a, a great deal of research on, and, and documented sort of the role of credit booms in, in sort of being a precursor to financial crises uh, and slowdowns in economic activity, you know, it definitely seems like an area ripe for, for exploitation. I think your question about persistence and permanence is spot on. Uh, we only stretched the date as far as we felt comfortable doing it, but it, it is completely true that um, there's a big difference between it lasts a long time versus it lasts forever from a theoretical point of view. Now, you could argue that with uh, any reasonable amount of discounting, when you get to 12 years, you're pretty much pretty close to permanent. But obviously, our paper cannot speak to, to that distinction, which is clearly important from a theoretical point of view. <laughs> In terms of subsamples, um, so remember that we have 17 countries. So we sort of uh, we, we estimated things over a full sample and also over a, a post-World War II sample, and there we have to rely basically more on the cross-section than on the time series, but that's the beauty of the panel that you get to, to do those things. But um, it, it was pretty robust. I mean, you saw the list of things, and part of the 90 pages that Margarita is uh, relating have to do with the fact that referees were rightly skeptical of, of the result, and so we tried to bombard it as much as possible. Okay, thanks a lot uh, again, and maybe we move to the next paper by Shebnem on the collateral heterogeneity of monetary policy transmission, evidence from loans to SMEs and large firms. Please. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Great, uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be here uh, at this great event. Uh, uh, I'm very happy to present this paper, joined with uh, Cecilia Chaglio and Matt Dars. They are both at uh, Federal Reserve Board, so the usual disclaimer applies. So what we would like to do in this paper is to study monetary policy transmission under heterogeneity, and we are going to focus on credit markets. So we really would like to understand this relationship you see on this slide, basically how do you go from interest rates, monetary policy interest rate, to outcomes such as investment and employment, and what is the heterogeneity, what is the role of heterogeneity in the credit markets in that process. And we are going to show you that for monetary policy effectiveness, going through interest rate to investment and employment, two types of heterogeneity are going to be critical in the credit markets. And that's going to be the size of the firm and the type of the collateral firm uses to borrow. Let me try to under, uh, you know, argue the importance of looking at such heterogeneity by using some motivation from recent events. I'm sure everybody in this room was following uh, the inflationary episode of the last two years and how central banks, ECB and Federal Reserve and others like Bank of England uh, has uh, fought this process. Uh, a big part of this debate in the US at least uh, is about what if this super fast tightening of the Fed uh, leads to a credit crunch and then what is going to happen in the real economy. In fact, around the time of the mini regional banking crisis, this was a very, very intense debate in the United States. Overall, nothing happened, of course. But at the time, this wasn't the uh, chatter. If you go back, uh, not just policymakers, also academics, everybody just rushed to look into bank-level data. In the United States, the high-frequency 
bank level data is going to be things like H8, page book, slow survey, and all of these things, in spite of the fact that not all banks in the United States report to these things, all of them showed some serious, serious credit tightening in the United States coming from mid-sized banks. When we say mid-sized bank in the United States, we are talking about banks between 50 to 250 billion in assets. So at the time when both practitioners and academics saw this credit tightening, immediate uh, assumed conclusion is, oh, the recession is coming, credit crunch is happening, that means SMEs are going to collapse and we are going to have a decline in employment and investment. And this is happening even before inflation back to 2%. So the, the alarm bells, stagflation is on the door and all that. Again, none of this happened. And at the time, uh, you know, we thought, because we have written this paper already, why nobody is talking about the other banks, the big banks. These banks are under regulation in the United States. Uh, this is known as the CCAR regulation, Federal Reserve Capital Assessment and Stress Testing Regulation. And when you actually look at those banks, uh, they provide 65% of the entire commercial and industrial lending, firm lending, as of now in the United States. And it provided 70% of the entire lending before 2020. There was some changes uh, during 2020, during Trump administration, where some of the banks dropped, but basically, and we are talking about here like, you know, 40 to 50 banks, and as you all know, US has up to almost 4,000 banks. You know, not a big part, but these banks actually provide a large part of the credit. So the big point we are making in this paper is you really need to look at the firm bank match data. Not firm data, not bank data, but firm bank match data if we would like to talk about the effect of credit on real economy. What we have witnessed in the last two years in the United States, this very strong dynamic US economy and the debate and the narrative is always about this mighty American consumer just consuming tight labor markets and all that. What we are going to argue that there is a mighty American firm counterpart to that mighty American consumer. And it is very important to understand that because this tells us the importance of the investment demand, credit demand during a tightening cycle and how that can also drive and underline a strong economy. So we need to be looking at things like who borrows from who and contrary to the conventional wisdom, small firms don't just borrow from small banks, they actually borrow from big banks as we are going to show in this paper. So what it comes down to when you want to understand the effect of credit on the real economy, real economy meaning investment and employment, the macro variables we care about, we really want to understand financial constraints. Which firm is financially constrained and what is the type of constraint we are talking about, earning base or asset base. So in the absence of a systemic econ-wide banking crisis, so things like 2008 in US, 2010 in Euro, the, the demand, not just consumer demand, not just labor demand, but credit demand and investment demand is going to be a very important part of the story and explain a lot about monetary policy transmission. So let me now come to our paper and how we are uh, giving uh, this message in this paper. There is of course an extensive theoretical literature in terms of understanding monetary policy transmission under heterogeneous agents. I would say most of this literature, almost like you know, 85% of this literature is on consumption. Very famous papers, Hank models. Uh, on the investment side, the literature is now picking up. There is a famous contribution by Otonella and Wimmer in Econometrica. Regardless of you are looking at the investment side or the consumption side, this heterogeneous uh, agent New Keynesian literature is really about some heterogeneity in financial friction. Consumption side looks at different uh, households uh, having different frictions and an investment side is also uh, doing that. Uh, some sort of uh, heterogeneous financial frictions affecting monetary policy transmission. The problem with this literature on the, on the investment side, on the firm side, not on the consumption side, there is also very rich empirical literature there, but on the investment and firm side, empirical literature unfortunately only works with listed firm data. Either CompuStat, I'm talking about the United States here, either CompuStat or very large firms from SNC, National Credit Registry, or Deal Scan, and so forth. Of course, you know, there is a big disconnect here because uh, SMEs, small medium enterprises, the United States, they are defined as less than 500 employees. They account more than half, per, half of the aggregate US employment and aggregate US output. There are these listed firms, which is large part of the empirical literature, only accounts for 26% of the aggregate US employment 
and 44% of aggregate US output. So what we do in the paper is first time use supervisory administrative data from the CCAR, from Federal Reserve Regulatory Data Set, which is going to give us a representative sample of firm financing for the US economy, and then basically bring in private firms and SMEs to the picture and see what is going on in terms of monetary policy transmission once we have a representative uh, set of firms. Okay, so we are going to contribute to a large literature. Obviously, I don't have time to go through, but you can think our paper as bringing together the original bernanke gertler type of literature that really thinks about uh, default risk and net worth and, and so forth with the Kiyotaki Moore type of literature that talks about the importance of uh, pledge and collateral. And we are going to show you that actual transmission is going to work uh, through both, both through firm default risk and firm collateral, and they are going to be heterogeneous across firms. Let me tell a little bit about data. So we are going to use Y14 data. So this is the US credit registry. So the US version of Anacredit in Europe. So this is collected as part of the Federal Reserve's capital assessment and stress testing. As I told you, it is collected from all bank holding companies with total consolidated assets above 50 billion uh, until 2000 and end of 2019. As of 2020, this threshold raised to 100 billion. So you get this data at the firm bank loan quarter level and the reporting threshold of uh, one million dollars. So similar to the Germany one, I believe Germany one is also one million euro. So any firm borrowing one million and up is going to be in the data set. So you observe the entire contract basically between the firm and the bank and also the firm balance sheet item. So you, you see not only how much firm borrows from the bank, but also other debt and equity financing on the firm balance sheet. The caveat is the, sh the time span, it is short because this data set uh, started being collected after the crisis as a response to crisis as part of the Dodd-Frank Act. So it started in 2012, third quarter. It covers all sectors, almost 4 million loan level observations from 150,000 plus corporations. Uh, and 60,000 of those are going to be SMEs, uh, meaning they are going to have less than 10 million in assets and less than um, uh, 50 million in, in sales. And just to uh, comparison, CompuStat is going to be something around 3,000 firms and much, much larger. Later, I'm going to show you the, the distributions. So, uh, and again, the data is real time. You can come up, up until now, but we stopped at least for these results. I'm going to show you today at the end of 2019 on purpose so that we don't get into the COVID shock, which is, of course, uh, is very special uh, on its own sets. In terms of the coverage, the banks reporting the Federal Reserve and how we read the firm level data from those banks reporting are going to be uh, accounting for 85% of the entire banking industry in the United States in terms of the assets. What is important for us, they are going to be providing 70% of the firm lending in the United States. So in that sense, we are getting supervisory data on private firm financing through the Federal Reserve, and this is going to be, that means representative compared to all other firm level data sets using the literature, you know, CompuStat, QFR, deal scan, capital IQ, small business finance, I mean, all the data sets in the, in the US literature that you don't know of. So why 14 firms overall is going to account for 65% of the US corporate sector debt and 78% of the aggregate US uh, gross output. Okay, so what are we learning new from this data set before I jump to regression that we didn't know before from the flow of funds data? Flow of funds data is the standard aggregate level data, now known as actually US financial accounts. If you want to do anything about corporate sector debt, you just go to this, this data. That's your first stop, right? Now, when you go to the uh, flow of funds and you say, okay, what is the, you know, the corporate sector debt in the United States? There are two series you can download. One is the non-financial corporate business. So the word corporate is very important there because th that word means large, okay? So this is actually going to be pretty much similar to the CompuStat data set, large listed firms. When you download that data set, so here you see in the, in the first uh, figure here, I cannot highlight, I don't know why. You, do you see it red dot? No, you don't see, okay. I'll, I'll keep talking. So that left side, you see you plot the share of debt coming from different lenders, okay, in the non-financial corporate business. You see a large part is going to come from the bond markets. US has very, very deep and large bond markets. That's known as the market debt, so this is no surprise, and given that those are the large firms, they are going to mostly finance themselves in the bond markets. Bank and non-bank debt, the red and the black, are going to be less. You can go and download another series called non-financial businesses, 
Now we are going to have smaller firms, although this data set is never ground up. It is not aggregated from the microdata because in the United States, firms doesn't have to report. They only report to the tax authority. They don't have to report to anyone, private firms. So this is based on, basically based on the estimates, uh, trying to incorporate from the financial sector reporting. But even, even with that type of estimate, now you get more smaller firms, you see how now the share of uh, market debt, bond market go down, they are becoming equal shares, market debt, bank debt, and uh, non-bank debt. You go to Y14 data and you ask, what is the share of bank debt of the private firms? And you look at the large ones, you, you know, divide them by large, medium, and small. So the large private firms, you see the bottom dash uh, dot line, it is exactly as in the flow of funds, right? It's kind of 25, 30% at most comes from the bank. But you go to the medium size and the small firms, so SMEs, their entire debt come from the bank. So this fact basically not you know, known as far as we know uh, before our paper. I mean, there's always this sense that small firms are bank finance. But at the same time, this narrative went with, as you know very well, oh, Europe is bank-based, everything comes from the bank, US is not, type of narrative. So this says, at least for SMEs, they are very similar. So US SMEs and European SMEs, they are very similar. They are entirely bank finance. What about the representation? I mean, I just you know, told you that we work with a representative data set. So we plot the Y14 on the left. So you can, we separate them as private and public. You see the private firms, the red, most of them are small firms, right? The first bar is less than 10 million in assets, where the public firms are going to be much larger in the blue. And on the right, you see in green a very much used data set in this literature, syndicated loans, that is also going to come with the covenant on information you see that that mimics pretty much the public firm data set. Why? Because to be able to be in that data set, you need to be borrowing 20 million from three banks. So we are talking about very large firms also in that data set. So we are going to have much more representative data set uh, coming from Y14. What about the financing conditions? Now, private firms and the public firms are going to have different financing conditions. If you just plot the median interest rate, you can see on the left, the interest rate is just much higher for private firms than the public firms. What is very important for our paper is the use of collateral on the right. You see that almost all the loans are going to be collateralized when it comes to private firms, small private firms, dash red line, it's going to be almost everything. And most of the private firms, the solid red line is going to collateralize. When you look at the public firms, you know, generally only half of the debt is going to be collateralized where even you go to the smallest public listed firms, still not all of it is going to be Collateralized, meaning public listed firms can also borrow without pledging any collateral in the United States. Okay, how are we going to map this heterogeneity in the credit markets, which is very uh, uh, extensive, to monetary policy transmission? Just taking the stock of what I said so far, first, private firms, especially SMEs, rely on bank credit to a large extent, similar to the SMEs in Europe. Second, when accessing bank credit, these firms are going to face higher interest rate and they, are, they have to pledge collateral. And third, I didn't show you this fact, but it is in the paper, plus it is a well-known fact from the firm dynamics literature, SMEs have higher investment and sales goals. So we do really care about these firms. These firms are the backbone of the economy in terms of growth, innovation, and so forth. Now, how does monetary policy is going to transmit differentially across this heterogeneity in the credit market? We are going to run uh, two simple regression, one for investment, the, the top one in equation one, and one for credit, the bottom one in equation two. Investment regression is going to be at the firm sector quarter level. F is firm, S is sector, Q is quarter. So we are going to use firm fixed effect, sector quarter fixed effect, and then interact our measure of monetary policy shocks, I will come that uh, in a minute, with a dummy of high leverage firm. So you see that that dummy is not going to vary over time, so we are going to classify uh, firms into one zero high leverage, low leverage, depending on their median average leverage is above or below the median. And then we are going to run a credit version of that. Now the credit version of the investment regression, of course, is going to be at the firm bank level. So we are going to aggregate all the loans between my firm and all the banks you know, I'm borrowing from. That's the left-hand side variable, and we are going to regress on firm bank fixed effect, sector quarter, bank quarter, because we would like to uh, kill the entire bank credit supply story here and we would like to focus on the firm credit demand and firm investment demand and then interact again the high leverage firm dummy with monetary policy shocks. 
Now, where is the identification coming from? It comes from the exogenous demand shifter, and that's the monetary policy. We just talk about that all day. And then here, we are just going to do the standard thing in the literature. Uh, this is the high frequency identification of monetary policy shocks at the quarterly level. Of course, these things are at FOMC level, so we are going to aggregate it to the quarterly frequency following the same methodology in the Ottonella Wimberg Econometrica paper. Now, the threat here is, of course, well, you can have these high leverage firms. Leverage is also an endogenous variable, right? And you can have them somehow non-randomly match to bad banks, high leverage banks. So this is the beauty of firm bank uh, match uh, level data. So we are going to run this equation three. Now, this is the uh, very typical regression run in this literature, the bank credit supply side, where you use firm quarter fixed effect, and you run the same regression to see if the results I am finding on the demand side is really coming actually uh, from the fact that this firm happens to borrow from a high leverage bank. And again, I don't have time to show you this result, but the answer is no. No, it's not a bank credit supply side story. It is a firm credit demand story because the period we study, there was no banking crisis. All right. Why firm leverage? Because firm leverage is used as a uh, variable to uh, proxy default. And here we verify that. Here we do a standard default probability regression on firm leverage and non-performing loans. And regardless of looking at all firms, private firms, or public firms, leverage actually predicts default. And this is an a, a assumption and a result that this literature uses a lot. So we also have uh, the state of the art there. We are not doing anything new there. OK, this is the benchmark result. So what is going on here? So the top is the investment regression. Uh, oh, sorry, both of these panels are investment regression that I showed you with different ways of uh, measuring leverage. The first panel is this distance to default type of idea, and the second one is the dummy variable, high leverage, low leverage idea. Both of them actually shows you that high leverage firms respond more, meaning invest more, during expansionary monetary policy. Why is that? It's a negative coefficient, as you see in the first column top and the bottom, so monetary policy expansionary surprise is negative, so negative, negative, positive. So uh, expansionary monetary policy, you invest uh, more. Contractionary monetary policy, you invest less. Who you uh, leverage firms, so this is a relative result. So this says leverage firms invest more during expansionary monetary policy, and leverage firms invest less during contractionary monetary policy. It's a symmetric result. Now, the interesting thing is this results come from private firms. As you can see, in fact, public firm result goes exactly the opposite. This is the finding in Otonel Levinberry paper. They also find what I show you in the third column. Public firms actually respond less during expansionary monetary policy, right? So here we have a result that all United F States firms, uh, leverage firms, invest more, but public, right? If you're a public listed company, it's exactly the other way around, and we do a lot in the paper to understand this uh, opposite result. This is the credit version of the regression. So again, now the left-hand side becomes the credit, and here I show the similar result to investment. High leverage firms are going to borrow more during expansionary policy. Again, negative coefficient. Expansionary policy is negative surprise. Again, result comes from the private firm. So high leverage firms borrow more, High leverage firms invest more relative to low leverage firms during expansion monetary policy if they are private firms. Okay, and of course the all firms result is going to come from private firms because there are just much more, uh, uh, many more private firms. Okay, so then we said that okay, of course leverage is an endogenous variable. So how do we get at this difference between size and leverage? We know that larger firms are more leveraged. This is a result in the paper. Here we show you the time series pattern, not much going on with the leverage ratio. When you look at the all firms, public firms is increasing, but in terms of a distribution, you see that there is a difference between a public firm leverage and a, a private firm leverage. So it's clearly a variable that is endogenous to size. So we run this regression where we have the leverage firm and the small firm together. And in fact, we find a very interesting result. So high leverage firm are going to respond more in terms of investment and credit, but small firms are going to respond less. Why? Because small firms are, of course, constrained. This is a result that is already in the literature. It is nothing new there. So when we run them together, uh, we show that actually high leverage small firms are the ones that are driving this bigger response coming from the high leverage firms. So that means there is some sort of relaxation of a financial constraint as a part of this monetary expansion. And wh what is that exactly? What is the financial constraint on the small firm that it seems to be leverage relaxing, so make that small firm 
uh, borrow more or make that leverage less default risky when monetary policy goes through an expansion. To understand that result, we look at collateral. And for collateral, we are going to go to loan level. So this left hand side is now going to be loan between a firm and a bank in a given quarter. The nice thing with this regression is like super tight identification because we can use triple fixed effects, right? We can use a bank firm quarter fixed effect. So everything is going to be identified from different loans with different collateral, different maturity, different types and all that. Here we are going to focus on the collateral type. Why do we do that? Because this data, uh, Y14 of Federal Reserve, is extremely rich in collateral heterogeneity. This is raw data. I'm not doing anything. This, this is how the data comes. All I'm doing is plotting the raw data across the United States firm size distribution, entire US firm size distribution. On the top box, I'm going to have small private. On the bottom right box, I'm going to have large public. The boxes y-axis is 100%, so add up to one. Basically, each color shows what fraction of the debt is collateralized by what, okay? There are six types in the data. Unsecured is the dark blue, blanketly in light blue, fixed asset light green, account receivable dark green, cash yellow, and real estate, which is how we think as collateral, land, real estate, houses, that's the orange. So a very interesting pattern across the firm size distribution here you can see obviously small private guys are more constrained, but they, mo they, most, they are the ones that use real estate most, but even that is only up to 30%. 60% of their debt is light blue and light, uh, dark green, which is blanket lien and account receivable. And when you move across the firm size distribution from small private to medium large private and the bottom, small public, medium public and large public, you completely go to unsecured borrowing, right? Dark blue means you just don't pledge anything. So we group this ourselves uh, as asset base, which is the real estate and fixed asset in orange, earning base, account receivable and blanket lien in, in light blue, and obviously dark blue is unsecured. And SMEs are going to be the firms in that red box on top, small private and the medium private firms. And you can see across the US firm size distribution, uh, the bigger you get, uh, you borrow less, using earning-based collateral, also asset-based collateral, and you just come to a point where you just borrow completely unsecured. Whereas if you are small, you use both real estate, but also a lot of earnings. In fact, most of your borrowing is going to be earning-based. And this goes very well with this new papers in the literature, Lian and Ma and Drehel, they work with different data set to back out what type of collateral use going on only for public firms and they f found out actually the real estate is not used much. Here we actually have data on the pledge collateral and we are showing that, I mean, this problem is even worse when you uh, go to the unlisted smaller firms. Okay, let me skip this. Let me show you two more results and I conclude. So these are the collateral regressions. Now in the collateral regressions, we are going to use, uh, we are going to look at both the credit. So the first two column is going to be private firm and public firm credit regression, as I was showing you before, although we are now doing at the loan level. And then the, we also look at the price, because the story here is of one where the supply of funds curve is going to be, uh, you know, the slope of that is going to be flatter with expansionary monetary policy. So we look at first, even before the monetary policy expansion, what happens with collateral use. Collateral use, you can see in the red box in the first column, gives you more access to credit if you're a private firm. If you're a public firm, the blue box next to it, it's exactly the opposite. So if you are pledging collateral, you will actually get less credit, which means there is a selection, right? Since public firms just borrow unsecured, if they happen to pledge a collateral, that means there's something really bad going on about them, right? So there's some sort of selection going on there. But for private firms, it is really an access to finance measure. With more collateral, you get more. The second row uh, in the first one and two column is the monetary policy expansion. So monetary policy expansion even strengthens this effect. So normal times you get more credit with collateral and during monetary policy you get even more. Why? Because that collateral we are going to show next is an earning based collateral. Of course monetary policy expands the value of that collateral exactly the same way it, it expands uh, the asset based collateral. On the pricing side you have credibility on the story because on the pricing side the column three you see that your default risk is lower when you use collateral if you're a private firm. So private firm pledging collateral borrows cheaply Whereas for public firm, pledging collateral borrows more expensive, right? So again, collateral is signaling distress for public firms, but for private firms, 
it is an access to credit measure. And expansion of monetary policy cannot do, undo that effect of expensive uh, loan for the public firm, but for private firm, it even puts that on, on steroids. Okay, and then this table basically going to tell you that the collateral that I just showed you is really about the earning based collateral. So if you, ah, now I have my red dot. If you look at here, all these collaterals that I showed you before, uh, the normal time result is about the earning based collateral, but the monetary policy expansion result, both of them works the same way. So we have the standard Kiyotaki Moore story, and we have an additional story on top of that. So monetary policy expansion, if you're a private firm, is going to expand your borrowing capacity when you use asset based and earning based collateral. But the fact that you are getting cheaper borrowing if you are a private firm is going to come from earning based constraint, right? Because earning based uh, constraint expands during monetary policy expansion because the economy is going to do it. You have more sales, more earnings, and that makes your access to funds at a cheaper rate. So your interest rate goes down. For public firms, neither the quantity nor the price result varies by the type of collateral. This blue box and this blue box tells you that it really doesn't matter if you're a public firm what type of collateral you use. Because normally you don't use collateral. When you use, that means you are desperate that you are using it. So regardless of asset base or earning base, you are not going to borrow more and you are not getting a cheaper rate just because you are using collateral as the private firms uh, get it. All right, and the final thing we do is we do a horse race to come back full circle because I started the presentation showing you that high leverage SMEs actually borrow more and invest more when monetary policy is expansionary. Then I showed you that, well, it might be that monetary policy is somehow relaxing their constraint, and I showed you that that is because they use a lot of earning base collateral to borrow. And here, when we do a horse race between them, we see that these leverage SMEs has are actually is backed up by their earning base constraint. They are backing that leverage with earnings. So when monetary policy expansion increases the value of the earnings, your constraint relaxes, your supply, your, you know, the, the funds become flatter, you get the loan at a cheaper rate. And we also carry this to a debt capacity variable. We show that high earning base uh, borrowing is going to give you more debt capacity. In fact, uh, now we actually solve the puzzle of opposite result between private firm and the public firm. Once we create this debt capacity variable based on earning base constraint, both public firms and the private firms, they, they now act the same. They both respond more to monetary policy expansions because monetary policy increased the value of earning base collateral. To conclude, we document new facts about the US credit market that highlight the importance of heterogeneity in firm size and then firm, uh, type of uh, firm collateral, the collateral they, uh, they pledge to borrow. This correlation between collateral pledging and default risk being positive for listed firms and being negative for private firms is a very important lesson, right? Because collateral obviously can capture two things, default risk and access to finance, and depending on what type of firm you are, this variable is going to capture different things. Now, private firms, SMEs, they mostly use earning base, not because they don't want to use uh, real estate. As I showed you, they are the ones who use a lot of real estate. It's just that they don't have it, right? These are small firms. They don't have that much capital, so they have to use their earnings to borrow additional, especially during boom times. So that means private firms and SMEs using earning base collateral become very important uh, trans conduits for the transmission of monetary policy because monetary policy expansion increase their ability to pay. So in that sense, monetary policy effectiveness depends on credit demand of these SMEs, especially during normal times, normal tightening and easing cycles when we don't have an economy-wide 2008 type of banking crisis going on. And quantitatively, I didn't uh, have time to show you, but 60% of the credit expansion during this period we are looking at that comes from the easy policy can be attributed to uh, this uh, relaxation of the leverage SMEs constraints. Thank you very much. Now, Katerina Bergen from the IMF will be the discussant. Well, thank you very much uh, for having me at this conference. It is a pleasure um, to talk about this uh, great paper. Um, congratulations. It is a very polished paper. It, some of you might have seen it already. It has been around for some time. 
um, which you can see it was not 90 pages, but equally as many robustness checks. So please uh, take the findings as, as, as Shabnam said them. Um, obviously, there's, the, there's a disclaimer. These are my views, not the IMFs. And also a little bit later, I want to show you some results that have been created with the help of AI that I also have to say. But back to the topic of this paper, um, as it is written in, in the February version that I read, it's really focused on uh, small risky firms and how the transmission of monetary policy through small risky firms uh, can be stronger also because of their collateral. Let me emphasize to motivate this paper is that theoretically it's not really clear whether small risky firms should react stronger or weaker to monetary policy. Uh, there can be models that say for small risky firms all that matters is default um, risk and therefore default premia. So uh, underlying interest rates don't matter that much. And the other side of the coin is that for small risky firms, financing costs are very high, so any change in monetary policy will matter a lot. So this paper uses microdata to really answer the question in which direction this goes. Also empirically, we have papers really connecting firm size to monetary policy transmission, but not at the loan level through the type of collateral. So this is really where this paper fits. Um, and to further emphasize this motivation, I found this table quite nice. Again, let me emphasize that this is very unique loan level data. At the time, I think the paper was written uh, for the first time, very new uh, data that hasn't been seen before. And as Shabnam said, she pointed out uh, the same stats that collateral seems very important for uh, small private firms. The lower yellow bar shows you that, I think also here, yeah, it's very weak, maybe you can see it, that 91, 92% of small firms uh, use collateral, whereas only 57% uh, of public firms. But even though they use more uh, collateral, they still pay higher interest rates. Um, again, this is probably default risk and so on, but it's obvious that collateral is very important uh, for small firms. And which collateral do they pledge? I use this more aggregated graph. Um, very obvious here, the small private firms, let me jump to the extreme. Most of their collateral is earnings based. So it's account receivables, inventory, blank accounts, and um, other, versus with size, the share of earnings based decreases. So I think my job as a discussant was a bit to summarize the very many findings in this paper. Uh, you just saw many tables and many interesting facts. So I'm trying to summarize uh, what I take from this paper. So there is a world um, that has small risky firms and large safe firms. And then Shebnam and co-authors, they use firm level data first to show that actually small risky firms, risky um, uh, estimated by leverage that small risky firms have a stronger effect of monetary policy because they invest more. Um, and larger, saints, larger, safer firms have a weaker effect, obviously relatively seen. And then they go on and use loan level data to show this intermediate step to show that this effect is actually um, as small risky firms pledge more earnings-based collateral, they show a stronger effect of monetary policy and large, safer firms place either no collateral or very little earnings based. Um, so this, this is my summary of the paper. So a bit like the discussion before, there are very many people uh, more experienced, more senior, smarter than me that have discussed this paper. So I'm not gonna give it uh, another take at the identification strategy, which is very, very rigorous. I don't think this needs another technical discussion, but maybe uh, let me focus on two questions in this discussion, which is what does this paper not cover? So which papers can we write going forward? And what lessons do we draw from it since this is conference is, is focused on bridging between science and practice? So what does this paper not show? Again, this is the graph, my summary graph from the, before. I mean, in a first step, it doesn't show the selection into earnings based uh, uh, why do small firms, small risky firms use more earnings based collateral? There might be an obvious reason that this is all they have. And I think this is the less interesting question. But the second question is indeed, so why is 
why does this earnings-based collateral um, enable them not just to borrow more during monetary expansions, but also to reduce these financial frictions because they get cheaper credit relatively seen to the large safer firms during monetary uh, expansions. So Shebnam mentioned that in monetary expansions, I guess in a macro world, um, thrown all together, there is more demand. And, and, and she cites um, a paper uh, that shows that in general equilibrium but maybe there's some new papers using microdata that can close the loop for you, not saying that uh, you, you have to show it in this paper, but that close the loop because um, if we ask that why this earnings-based collateral helps them to get more credit during uh, a monetary expansion could be, for example, these three papers. There's one paper by Knox and co-authors that shows that using, again, microdata, that monetary policy announcements are equity premium events. So when monetary policy is expansionary, um, equity tends to go up. Second, um, there's a paper by Knox and Timmer that shows that especially small firms, and this is relatively higher for the small firms that you're using in this paper, their equity reacts stronger to inflation and cost shocks because small firms have less market power, so they're more exposed to cost shocks. So let's imagine the central banks react to a cost shock and tightens monetary policy or loosens monetary policy in response to a cost shock. It might be especially the small firms that react and their equity price, which probably they're pledging in what you call earnings-based collateral. Uh, a third, um, a third more theoretical, but they also use microdata explanation ca can have that. In most of our models, firms have uh, finance constraints, and this particular paper uh, spe specif specifies an earning-based finance constraint, and this is relaxed every time monetary policy is loosened or there's a negative monetary policy shocks. So these, uh, maybe uh, for your reading list, or further to close the loop that you, that you have in this paper that really this earnings-based collateral is enabling them to borrow not just more during an expansion, but also cheaper, which is what I found even more uh, interesting. So the second question I promise to uh, at least take a, take a try at answering is, what do we take uh, forward from this paper? So the first question I ask myself is, is this applicable? Is, are the results applicable to other regions of the world since we're in this house? Uh, let me try to uh, at the euro area. So again, the main findings are of small risky firms that pledge a lot of earnings-based collateral. So I asked AI, so find the share of small firms in the euro area. It's very fast, uh, but I still highlighted it in yellow for her here. So Copilot found for me that it's even more here. I mean, Copilot messed up and uh, mixed up Euro area and European Union. So I guess my manual work is not entirely uh, for nothing, but uh, it, it says almost 99% in the European Union have, le have less than 49 employees. So policymakers here, the findings are very much applicable in terms that we have a lot of small firms. But now, do these euro area firms also place more uh, earnings based collateral compared to US firms? And there, actually, Copilot uh, says no. In the euro area, small firms often rely more on traditional forms um, of collateral, like property or equipment, due to stricter banking regulations or a more conservative bank lending culture. In contrast, US firms might have slightly more flexibility in using earnings based collateral, thanks to a more diverse financial market and innovative lending practices. So, Copilot there um, is being very wishy washy and uh, not ha helping very much. So, then I went into banking regulation. Uh, uh, didn't, didn't have that much. And I found capital requirements regulation in the European Union number uh, 575 sets very strict requirements of what type of collateral can be used, especially for small firms uh, that have no history. And it sets out higher risk weights for riskier collateral under which earnings based collateral will be categorized. Therefore, if you are a policymaker in a country and you ask yourself, are Shebnam's findings applicable to my country or what can I do about it? First question is, do I even have a lot of small firms for the euro area? The answer is yes. And then do they use earnings-based collateral? This is my, might be something that is not set in stone for you as a policymaker, as the number of small firms might be set in stone uh, at a given point in time, but capital regulation, you might be able to tweak. So if you maybe potentially want a higher transmission of monetary policy, Maybe through capital regulation, you could increase the use of earnings-based collateral. Obviously, as Philip said, 
there is no silver bullet to fixing everything. This might be capital uh, regulation, might be a th small thing that we tweaked. But as Philip also showed in a graph, is that capital ratios have now been higher than ever. So this might be something that uh, to consider if we want the coming loosening of monetary uh, policy to be transmitted um, further. Summing up, this is a great paper on its way to a top five journals. There are rumors that uh, it's, it's on a very straight path, um, but it gives us a lot of material for further research and we should uh, think more and I encourage the authors maybe to extend the conclusion to think more about the policy decision beyond the scope that there could be a lot of small firms somewhere else. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Shamni, you want to reply first to the discussion? No, great. I, I agree with everything. And uh, so <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, uh, I cannot say anything about banking regulation and the, the fill uh, thing, <laughs> so, but it is very interesting. And first of all, we, we should definitely incorporate those papers and the channels. Uh, just, just a clarification point. Uh, I'm sure the regulation is thicker here. And in fact, uh, Nobuki Otake told me that in Japan, firms can never pledge their, their earnings. But here, you see, we take a very uh, broad, I mean, because, because in the raw data, they pledge account receivable and blanket lien, right? Blanket lien is really their equity. Yeah. So it ties very back. It's the value of the firm, right? So, it, but account receivable, that's what Nobu was telling me, it's never allowed in Japan. Europe might be the same. But if, for example, Europe allows that you can pledge a patent, or anything about the value, that goes to the, again, the earnings, mm -hmm. right? I mean, mm -hmm. so basically anything that is not equipment, land, you know, the firm real estate, value. and all, exactly, the, the firm value. But I fully agree, it's great, great comments, and we, we will definitely think For more. your next paper. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Maybe I open the floor to questions. Maybe just having a while uh, uh, waiting for a question. Can you probably uh, dig a bit deeper into what you think the external validity of your uh, yeah. paper is for other path or the other jurisdiction? And what are the crucial elements? Yeah, again, like, yeah, this goes to Caribou. So let me be very clear. The asset story just works as, as usual, right? So if you tell me, okay, in this jurisdiction, you can only borrow if you pledge, like if you're a small firm, you pledge your house, or if you pledge your you know, uh, equipment, that story is there. I mean, we are not saying that story is not there, right? What we are saying is, uh, if you, know, you kind of extend the things that uh, are procyclical in value, I mean, why the standard asset story works? Because of the procyclical values, right? I mean, the good times, asset values go up, Bad times, asset values go down, and that when the asset is a collateral, it gives you prosecco. So the paper overall, in terms of external wealth, is saying if firms can borrow with other procyclical things, right, then then you have this extra kick. That's basically what it's saying. So any uh, you know type where the banks uh, you know give firms more borrowing capacity, more that capacity, just because with another uh, asset that's value is procyclical, then monetary policy. That's going to make monetary policy transmission, you know, uh, stronger, right? It also goes through there. When it's going to be relevant, this is going to be, of course, relevant either for small firms or in jurisdictions where it is hard to pledge some real estate, right? So, uh, in that sense, actually, I would put it, um, you know, a paper where it actually provides a lot of external value to settings like emerging markets, for example, right? A lot of firms are going to small; they don't have that much physical capital, but if somehow they can they can allow, they are allowed to pledge things that relates to their ideas, to intangibles, to make that firm valuable. Uh, and that value is like some sort of pro-cyclical with the business cycle. Uh, this, is, this, is, this mechanism is going to work, yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. Let me see, I, I have a question. Yeah, please. Well, it's a quick question. Sure. The share of employment yeah. in, in small and medium enterprises is you said it was 55 or something like that percent SMEs yeah private firms much more than that right but so in cyclical downturns what is the share of employment destroyed by what each guys? category yeah is it the same no no we, I mean okay so we can definitely look at employment I'm sure you know this is done in the firm dynamics literature but we know from the work of John Haltwanger and others uh, these SMEs are also the ones that are, you know, come and go very quickly, right? That they are the most volatile groups. They, they go very quickly, they come very quickly, so that means that employment share 
should also be fluctuating. But here, so we are not only talking about these like very small firms. That's why I put it as SMEs, right? I mean, just the whole thing is really about like the private firms as a group, and there are going to be large private firms too. So that group as a whole is going to be 70% of the aggregate US employment, right? So even like the very small guys are going to be this like very high churn. There's going to be the mid groups that are going to be lower than that. So overall still a very relevant group if you want to understand investment and employment in the aggregate. That's, that's, the, that's the point we are making, which we always go to listed firms and they are going to be much, much smaller share. Okay, thanks, a question there. So this um, Bernhard Winkler here from the ECB. I used to look at the flow of funds euro area during the Lehman crisis. So I uh, appreciate you showing the flow of funds charts. We can uh, learn a lot already from the big picture, from the yeah, aggregate. Yeah, of course. Uh, and I also agree with your plea that the Hank literature has to move on to the firm sector from all the focus on the household side. There's a lot of discussion about the household savings overhang during the um, COVID period and all that, Lot, much less discussion about the corporate sector. So one question for you, why don't you extend your sample now to the COVID period? Yep. There is so much action, the next paper must be, please, on the COVID period. Yeah. And the other question I had, I'm not as smart as AI, um, <laughs> but I also didn't understand uh, exactly what earnings-based financing means. Uh, is it uh, free cash flow? Is it uh, profits? Is it uh, liquid assets? Is it receivables? Things like that. And that would be quite important to know also for the COVID period. There was so much public support. Yes. The federal programs, the Fed mainstream lending program, uh, moratoria, and to really see maybe there was too much accommodation of what happened. And you see this from the money supply figures <laughs> in 2020 more than 20% M2 growth in 2020. So maybe there was a, um, a liquidity overhang which then somehow transformed into a inflation hangover um, um, just for the kind of monetarist tradition. And it would be very valuable to really match your kind of uh, granular data with the big picture, the money, money aggregates and also the flow funds data that you showed. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. We, okay, originally we didn't do COVID exactly because of what you are saying, because the, the uh, again, we don't have to call it earnings, right? I mean, if you don't like, we can just say what it is. It is account receivable and blanket lien. Blanket lien is like an uh, entire thing on the value of the firm, uh, and account receivable is account receivable. So that's really the big, the, the, in the paper we show every category and all the results are driven by those two categories. So, and that's why we didn't do COVID because COVID is a shock to that, of course. <laughs> account receivable, right? And with all supply chains, and all that. We interviewed the, uh, you know, quite a bit of bank and firm CEOs during this period, because I mean, to me, a, a country like US spending trillions, and they did all that spending, and on top of that, they did a PPP program, uh, which is almost a one trillion dollar program only for SMEs, right? I mean, this money given to SMEs with the condition that they keep employment. So the first question I ask, why the banks are not doing this? And then when we interviewed, and that's exactly that, because banks don't know if that money is coming, right? I, they first gave extension from 30 days to 60 days to 200, but then they never extend that bridge loan, which is why the federal government has to come in. So this is why we said, like, look, this is just too good for our story. This is a direct shock to collateral earnings. They are not extended credit, so all the results are going to come from that side, so we didn't do it. But now we are extending it, and then we will, because we have these results already, and we are going to extend, which will also give us bigger monetary policy shocks. That's also good, because one of the critics of the paper is like the period, of course, is a ZLB period, right? So, I mean, you know, what, what are you talking about? They are, they are very small. So, yes, we are, we are now extending. But originally, we didn't extend, because, we didn't do that period because of the reasons. Okay, thanks a lot. I think our time uh, is ended now. So thanks again to Oscar, Margarita, Shebnem, and Katarina for the great paper and discussion.